Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to see everyone in the house of the Lord this morning. We're so happy to be here. Uh, we believe that the Lord is doing things, that he is present in this service. And uh, we believe that we're going to encounter God here this morning. Do you believe that? Amen. All right. Well, if you're willing and able, let's stand and have a word of prayer and let's just worship God. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are present with us this morning that you are just infinitely loving to this group of people, Lord, to those that are online, to, to your body of believers, that you just pour out your unfathomable love. And at our best, we can never truly comprehend how much you truly love us, Lord. We are thankful that you have brought us through storms, that you have empowered us to live well, that you have given us the Holy Spirit to direct us in the way that we should go. And uh, Lord, you've just helped us to grow closer to you and grow closer to each other, Lord. You've empowered us to have healthy relationships. You've empowered us to love with the love that we've seen through Jesus. And God, we want to live this out every day. We want to be men and women that are after your heart. And I pray that that would start here this morning. As we hear your word, as we sing your praise, that our hearts would be open and receptive to the work of the Holy Spirit, to the leading and the direction that you're just putting into us, Lord, and that we wouldn't harden our heart to that, but we would have soft hearts that are receptive to hear your voice. And God, I pray that as we sing these songs, they would honor and glorify you, that you would feel authentic praise from Curvinsville Alliance, and that our hearts would be united under the desire to praise and honor you for the glorious and amazing God that you are. We love you, and we praise you, and we ask that you help us to do all of these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Too high. It wasn't mine. 
know this next part. I need a rescue. My sin was heavy. Let's sing it together. I need a rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I need shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. give the Lord a hand this morning. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Kermansville Alliance. We're really glad that you're here. You're looking at these flags and you're saying, what is this? Had a guy who served in the military who walked through here and says, I feel like I'm in a dining hall in Kuwait, but that's not where you are. Um, where you are is at Kermansville Alliance. Our missions festival is coming up in a couple weeks, and these are flags representing a number of the countries that uh, we serve uh, with missionaries, and we're really thankful for that opportunity to do that. I'm going to talk to you about that in more detail in a couple minutes, but I do want to remind you that um, tonight is the first night of our youth group meeting uh, for the fall season, and they call themselves Nightlife, and they meet tonight from 5.30 to 7.30, uh, 7th through 12th grade, and uh, yeah, they're clapping. Is that right? Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> Was that the students or the teacher clapping? <laughs> no, the teacher claps when it's over, right? <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, we're really glad. You know, one of the things we do is we provide food sometimes for our, our uh, teens in nightlife. And if you can help with that, if you can help with that on the bulletin board near the elevator sign-up sheet. I saw a lot of names on there. It'd be a great way for you to help out with that. I uh, also want to mention that kids' time starts tonight from 6.30 to 7.30. That's eight-year-olds through sixth grades. And Stacy Sr. is managing that. So if you want to participate in that, bringing the kids, that would be great. Um, um, we need some nursery workers because I, I just want to... I want you to this. Matt McCracken walks by me in the hallway today. Where are you, Matt? Hi, Matt. Matt McCracken walks by me in the hallway and says, look at these kids. Look at these kids. And I want to tell you why these kids are here. Number one, a woman who died, I did her funeral probably 15 or 20 years ago. Her name was Esther Barrett. Esther Barrett prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that we could fill this building with children because she loved kids and she loved, she was a Sunday school teacher for like 120 years, like forever, <laughs> right? And she prayed until her dying day. She was praying for this church that kids would be here. That's one reason they're here. Another reason we're here is because of you, your volunteers. As volunteers, you make all the difference in the world. We can't do this without volunteers. And we're so thankful for that. Um, and, and that's the second reason they're here. The third reason they're here is because God's here. And he wants them here. He wants them to learn about him. The most important thing you can give a child is an awareness of God's presence and his great love for them. And so uh, parents are aware of that, and we have kids here as a result of it. So uh, we need volunteers, and some of those volunteers we need are nursery workers. And if you would like to be a nursery worker, right on here there's a phone number for Stacy to call. Is it right? Yeah, Stacy, and she'd be glad to talk to you about that. Something we do at Kermansville Alliance is all of our workers naturally have all their clearances. Bethany takes care of doing that, and there's no charge if you're a volunteer. We just take care of that. We help you work through the steps of that uh, effectively. And uh, then those clearances that you get, they might be used elsewhere if you have to go to a little league or something like that. Uh, but we'll, 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 take the, we'll take the itch, the, the sting, the, the pain. We'll take the pain out of getting your clearances uh, because we're pretty good at that. And we work really hard to ensure that everyone in our uh, ministry, children's ministry, has their clearances. Okay? There's a junior high youth retreat. It's actually a middle school youth retreat coming up in late September, nope, October. That's sixth through eighth graders. And uh, that information is here in your bulletin. If you're that age, uh, please jump on board with that. If you have questions, see Milton. Milton, I'm going to make you stand. Would you please stand? This is Milton McDonald. Speak to him if you're that age and you want to go to that retreat. Milton, did they go last year? They did go last year. And it was really boring and terrible and painful. Yeah, that's why we're going back. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, Milton. I appreciate that. Yeah, it was a, it, I understand it's a great retreat. And, uh, and those kind of things can really be life-changing. And so if you uh, have opportunity uh, to go to that and you'd like to go to that, speak to Milton about that. Again, that's for sixth through eighth graders. It's late October that we're doing that. Um, and I can't even remember where it is, but it's out of town that that retreat is going to be happening. Hey, Board of Ministries, there's a meeting um, that's going to come up this week. Don't forget about that meeting. Um, let me talk to you about yesterday. Yesterday, a group of us went to Mahaffey Camp, which is only 20 minutes from here. Uh, it was a guy's men's retreat. And the speaker there, he spoke about, uh, he had three different messages he brought. He, he's kind of a, a lumberjack kind of guy, uh, Ed is. And um, he's the kind of guy you wouldn't want to fight, especially if he's holding an ax. Um, you're probably okay if he has one of those those sanders, what are the, what's that sander called again? Some, uh, an angle grinder, yeah. Because he found, he found, do you know that you can buy this? You can buy a chainsaw blade for an angle grinder. Did you know that? And, and, and Ed found out you can operate that without the guard in place. And when you operate that without the guard in place, you get to go to the emergency room. And so that was kind of interesting. Uh, he told us about that. But he's the kind of guy who he really motivates men well. And, and he spoke yesterday, he spoke, spoke, he brought with him something I'd never heard of before, it's called a brush axe. In fact, he gave away four or five of those uh, yesterday. And it's an antique tool, and you've got to be a man to use, you've got to be tough to use it. And, and he, it's, you take it and you can cut out the brush with it. It's like an axe, but the end of it has kind of a hook on it instead of just a single blade. And he said, uh, so the first thing, guys, what you need to do is you need to clear the brush out of your life. And he's talking about the sin in your life. He talked to us about that. And then the next thing he said is that you have to build your life. And you, have, you need to build good structures in your life. And the third thing he said was that um, you're going to need to fight to keep those structures in place. And, and, you know, you hear about that. You're like, oh, yeah, teach men to fight and stuff. You don't have to teach men to fight. They just do that naturally. You have to teach them to fight the right way. And fighting the right way is on your knees. Amen. Fighting the right way is on your knees. And we really ended our time praying for one of the guys there that had a physical need. And I feel like we fought for him and when we were praying together. It was great to be with 250 guys or so, however many there were. Uh, we're all in teams, and my team, we really performed the best, but we came in 19th. I don't know how that happened. Um, but I'll tell you what, we're better at shooting guns than we are hitting golf balls, that's for sure. Uh, there was a lot of different places to go and enjoy. But what, what I loved about that thing is how, how God uses it to, to change lives. One of the women came to me first thing this morning and said, when was the first time you invited the guys to the men's link thing? when Ed was doing it. And I said, 2013. And she said, thank you for doing that. It has changed my marriage. It's changed our family. It's changed, it's changed everything. And so uh, these retreats, you know, the Jolt Retreat and all the stuff that you get to do here at Kermansville Alliance, Missions Festival included, these are things that can impact your life for eternity and impact the life of people around you. I really encourage you to plug into as many of them as you can and get your kids involved in as many as you can and volunteer for the nursery to make the wheels turn so everything happens. I want to talk to you about Missions Festival that's coming up. Um, you should have received one of these. Uh, when you walk in, there ought to be more of them. Autumn, did we print a fresh batch of these? Okay, so we'll have more of them next week. Yeah, there's some back there right now. But this has a schedule in it. And what I want to tell you is the 21st through the 24th of September, that belongs to you and God. Um, set that time aside if you can. That's only coming up in, what, 11 days? This is the 21st, I think. Um, and we're going to have an international worker here from Africa. And he's going to be speaking to the men in our church on Thursday night. We have a men's group that meets every Thursday night. I think there were 16 of us there this past week. Um, but we're inviting all the men, all the men to join us. We'd like you to sign up because we want to feed you. And uh, so we'd like you to sign up, if you would, for that gathering. Uh, you can sign up on the, on the bulletin board near the elevator or even online. Uh, but do sign up in a timely fashion if you can. That's going to be in the evening from 7 o'clock till probably 9.30ish, something like that. And the location will be determined. Go to the CurbinsvilleAlliance.org and go to the pastor's blog, and I'll have that up there the day of that event so you know where you're going to be. You say, why can't you decide the location? Because we never meet in a building for the men's group. We usually meet around a fire on a hilltop. Or we meet on a porch if it's a little bit rainy. Or if we really want to be wimps, we meet in a garage. And uh, so it depends on the weather, really. Uh, so um, look for that on Thursday, the 21st. On the 22nd, we're going to have pizza and wings and ice cream in the activity center. You can sign up online for that because we need to know how much pizza to get. That's a family event. So bring everybody. That's at 6 o'clock. That's your supper that night. 
and then Eric's gonna speak here in the sanctuary. I'm sure he'll use the PowerPoint with slides and everything. Uh, Eric's probably 30 years old, would you say, Laurel? 29? 32. Yeah, maybe 32. 32. Yeah. He's yeah. the same age as Lester. And he, he has a wife and kids. He's just a great guy. You will love him if you haven't met him before. And then Saturday is kind of a cool day. We're going to just have breakfast. It says Eric's going to speak, but he's not. I told Eric, you can just mingle with people. So that's a family breakfast. We're going to feed you breakfast at 8 o'clock, and Matt's in charge of that. 8.30, sorry, 8.30. Matt's in charge of that. And then at 10 o'clock, those people who would like to do this, we're going to take our shotguns. We're going to go to Glen Ritchie Sportsman Club. We're going to shoot clays there. And I just want to warn you that Danielle, Danielle Gaines is going to be here, and she's already signed up. And... She shoots a shotgun really, really well, guys. So, you know, you might want to practice a little bit before you get there. Um, but it's, it's just a fun time to be with Eric, the international worker, and to be together. That'll be from 10 o'clock till noon at Glen Ridge Sportsman Club. And then that evening, it's a youth activity at 7 o'clock at the church. Uh, so teens can be involved in that. Uh, there may be guns involved in that as well, but they're Nerf guns. So I think we'll be okay there. And then Sunday morning is Sunday morning. I'll let you read about that. Do think about how you're going to... Uh, Respond to this. If you're called or someone in your family is called to ministry internationally, uh, listen to the heartbeat of that call and engage in it. If you're called to give, uh, listen to the heartbeat of that call. Listen to God's spirit speak to you. Uh, that's why we have these things, so he can talk to you. Okay? Let me talk to you about a couple things we're praying for at Kermans Alliance. There's 100 on the list. I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. Becky Baroni had uh, surgery, and she is here this morning. And where are you, Becky? I'm looking for you. There she is. And she is filled to overflowing with joy, right? Good surgery, good outcome. Her husband looked at her on the way home and said, that was prayer, man. That was prayer. And so we're really praising God about that. Uh, also, do be praying for Doug Vaughn with a physical need. And remember Andy Fraley recovering from surgery and Angie Broad uh, as well. Don't forget about Janet Billet. Uh, be praying for her. She's having uh, chemotherapy. Yes. And uh, so pray for her regarding that if you would. I'm just going to highlight a couple more on here. Sean and Pamela are not here this morning. They're expecting. Remember that. And, of course, B&E are expecting. Uh, remember that. As you're praying regarding B&E... Um, that's my daughter and her husband, who oversees. Um, we're going there in October. That's when the baby's due. We just need you to pray that that baby will stay put until we get there. That's the big request, okay? And so be, be praying about that if you would, all right? Great. There's other things to pray about. I'm going to let you read those on your own. I'm going to ask those who are going to be uh, taking the offering this morning if you would come at this time. I also want to say to you that if you're visiting Kermansville Alliance, this is a time when those of us who call Kermansville Alliance our church home give our tithes and offering. If you're visiting, we certainly don't expect you to give. You're our guests, and we want you to just enjoy the presence of God here this morning, and we trust that that <coughs> will indeed happen. We're thankful that you're with us this morning. I'm going to ask uh, Tim Smay, our outreach coordinator, if he would ask God to bless the offering this morning. Tim? Amen. Once you've added your offering, feel free to stand with us. Uh, we're going to continue to worship the Lord and just celebrate who Jesus is this morning. Oh, my words fall short. I've got nothing new.
Yeah, let's give the Lord a hand. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. That song always reminds me, of, if you're familiar with the Christmas tune, The Little Drummer Boy. Mm. You know, I have nothing else to give but this. Let us pray. Lord God, we are humbled to think that that in your sovereignty, in your, in your infinite wisdom, that you, God, would desire to have a relationship with us. We cannot get our finite minds wrapped around that. Yeah. We'd probably drive ourselves crazy trying to figure it out. So God, instead what we do is we, we just ask that you would give us childlike faith. Regardless of our age, that we would see that you cared for us enough. That you would come to earth, born of a virgin. You lived a sinless life. You interacted with a bunch of mess-ups and goof-offs like us mm -hmm. to redeem us, to be with us, to save us. Thank you, Lord. That even now you don't leave us as orphans, God, but you, you've baptized us with your Holy Spirit and you walk with us daily, communicating with us, nudging us, interacting with us, comforting us, encouraging us, challenging us. And we have the promise that you will return as a reigning king. Jesus, we thank you for this amazing truth. And it's this foundational truth, this rock that we, we should be building our lives upon. And as we discussed in Sunday school this morning, we should not be adding to it. Because when we do that, we're just putting hay that's going to burn up anyways. It's not going to last. So instead, God, may we fix our lives. May we, may we anchor ourselves to the Lordship of Christ in all things. I pray, God, for all of us in this building this morning that we would have a deep awareness in our hearts and our minds and the very core of our beings that you fight for us. that you love us where we are and you, you, you want so much more for us. You want us to experience the fruits of the spirit of love and joy and peace and patience, self-control, goodness. You want to be involved in our lives. So I pray this morning that the distractions of our lives, the things that occupy our spaces of our mind, God, that they would be prioritized the right way. Yes, God. That all of the good things, even that you've done here locally in this church, God, that we wouldn't get distracted in programming, but we would continue to pursue you above all things. God, as we look at your word this morning, I pray that it would have a violent, radical effect in our lives. That it wouldn't just be head knowledge that we would check at the threshold of the door as we climb into our vehicle, but God, it would be something that would ripple out, not just tomorrow or even later today, God, but it would change future generations in our families. It has the ability to break generational sin. It has the ability to change lives for all of eternity. But it starts with us. It starts with us having a desire and a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Your word tells us that we are blessed when we are like that because we're going to be filled. So I pray this morning, Jesus, fill us. In your name I pray. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you. At this time, the children are dismissed. If they'd like to go to Children's Church, I think it's ages four through seven, they're welcome to do so. So have a good time, you guys. Some of you, I saw your disappointment on your faces that you're not ages four through seven and you're stuck here with me. But I think you'll enjoy the, the message this morning. Anybody remember my password? <laughs> this week, uh, this week, my uh, son and his family were here. And uh, so I work out of my study and at home. And I just relocated my office into the living room where my son was working. He is uh, a computer en- engineer who works for a defense contractor in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So he was sitting there with a laptop, uh, and he was writing code. And I was sitting with my laptop in the other uh, chair in the living room, and I was writing this sermon. And when I opened it this morning, it says, is less than HTML is greater than... I, th- I, mean, I think we got it mixed up. I think he's going to be giving my sermon, and I'll be giving code. <laughs> something told me. I thought about telling that joke, and something told me, don't, don't tell that because only the nerds will get it. But I love the nerds. I love us nerds, so that's good stuff. So today we're going to be looking at a number of scripture passages, and um, you could thumb through your Bible to find them, or you could use the YouVersion Bible app. If you zoom in on that QR code, you're going to find uh, a link that will take you right to the Bible app event that we have this morning, or I have other news. I have almost every passage I'm using on the screen this morning. I don't like to do that because then that can make you kind of lazy, um, but uh, <laughs> I, want, I do want to serve you. And I always want you to see what we're saying, how it comes from the heart of God and how it comes from Scripture. Our key verse this morning is Proverbs 4.23. It's in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. It's right-hand corner. And it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from there, comes from there. That's a great passage of Scripture. Uh, But again, I'll put most of the passages of Scriptures on the screen this morning. We've been talking for the past couple months. In fact, this is the eighth sermon in the series about relationships, how to have good relationships. And the theme that we're talking about kind of covers how do I have good relationships? And it's based on just the concept that somewhere along the way, most of us learn that the most rewarding part of living is found in relationships. Yeah, that's true. And somewhere along the way, most of us learn that the most difficult part of living is found in relationships. Sometimes we just don't understand the humans and why does God like them? Because they're not always likable and sometimes it's hard to have relationships. Today I want to talk to you about the influence that joy, namely the joy that you have, the influence that it has on the relationships that you have. Because it almost goes without saying that joyful people are people that it's nice to be around. You enjoy being with joyful people. And people that are kind of the ones that suck the joy right out of living, those are people you avoid. I guarantee you that you have had people in your life that when you saw them walking toward where you were walking, you diverted your path to go somewhere else. It's just part of who we are. It's part of who they are. You don't want to be a joy sucker. I want to ask you, though, do you pour out joy? Or do you tend to take it away? So I looked for one of those quizzes online, like a BuzzFeed quiz that would say, you know, are you a joy sucker? Ten questions to determine if you're a joy. There is no such thing. So I asked ChatGPT, do you know what that is? The artificial intelligence engine, probably the more popular of the ones that are out there. I asked ChatGPT to make me a quiz to determine if I was a joy sucker, if you were a joy sucker. And when I did it, I was surprised by two things. First, I was really surprised at how good it did. It wrote a really, really good quiz. And the second thing that I was surprised by is when I took this quiz, I tested positive. (laughs) I am a joy sucker. And and I read it to my wife. I said, I I just tested positive for being a joy sucker. And she's sitting there and she says, what? And I said, listen to these questions. And I'm reading them to her one at a time. She's going, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's right. You are a joy sucker. And I said, wow, that's not pouring out joy when you tell me that, sweetheart. (laughs) I know what all you're thinking. You're thinking, I kind of like take that quiz. You're in luck. Because I condensed it to five questions, did a little bit of editing, and I'm going to put it on the screen for you. I want you to count, there's going to be five questions here, I want you to count how many of these questions you would say yes to. Don't say it out loud. 
but how many of these questions would you say yes to? Number one, do you often find yourself complaining more than those around you? Number two, do you frequently criticize or judge others? Number three, do you bring up past mistakes or failures in conversations? Number four, are you quick to point out problems without offering constructive solutions? And number five, are you a pessimist who regards yourself as a realist? <laughs> I'm going to admit I tweaked that one a little bit. Yeah. So how'd you do? Uh, you know, if you got one yes on this, you're Congratulations, you're probably not a joy sucker. That, that's really good. If you got two or three yeses on this, you might want to look into how others are viewing you and how you're being perceived. And if you got four or five off of these, this explains a question you've always wanted. Why? You've always wanted to know. Why am I never invited to my own birthday party? <laughs> why, right? Yeah. Okay, now quizzes like this, whether they're written by the artificial intelligence or they're written by professionals, they really have very little meaning. In fact, they're not even written to have meaning. The whole purpose of questions like this is to get you thinking about the subject. Am I a person who pours out joy or not? I scored very high on this. I scored five yeses on this, right? But I'm the kind of person who's kind of hard on myself, you know? Another person maybe didn't score any on this, like, no, I'm not any of this, and maybe that person just doesn't look at themselves honestly. But the real, the real value in this is, it gets you thinking about, am I the kind of person who pours out joy? I believe that the answer to that question, if you are the kind of person who pours out joy or not, I believe it's really a matter of your heart. Jesus says it's not what goes into a person that makes them clean or unclean, it's what comes out, because out of your heart, that's really showing, showing what you're made of. And our verse today, Proverbs uh, 4.23, it says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Whether you're pouring out joy or you're pouring out something else, it's coming from your heart and what's in your heart. It'd probably be good for us to talk about, you know, what is the difference between joy pouring and joy sucking? And and, and when you think about this, it kind of makes sense. I think one of the fundamental differences is it's a matter of grace versus criticism. Jesus is the embodiment of grace, and he poured out joy. Satan is not the embodiment of grace. In fact, he is the accuser. If you happen to be reading the book of Revelation, along about chapter 12 in verse 10, John writes these words, he says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and power and the kingdom of God and the authority of his Messiah. And then he says, For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before God, day and night, has been hurled down. That's Satan, the accuser. He's the accuser of the brothers and sisters. Jesus pours out joy Satan sucks the joy right out of the room. Jesus is gracious. Satan wants to criticize and condemn. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus, in his graciousness, makes people into joy pourers by making them gracious. Joy suckers, they're critical and condemning of everyone. I wish I could remember who this was. It was an NFL football player. And I, I heard him being interviewed. And he had been playing for a team that was not successful. And um, he had been traded to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And he was talking about the difference between Team A and Team B. And, and when he came, when he was on the other team, you know, uh, they weren't winning ever. And so going into the locker room the following Monday wasn't a real joy. But here he comes to Steelers, and he has high hopes. He's like, whoa, it's going to be different to be with a team that's winning because the Steelers were doing well at that time. And, and so he came to the Steelers, and wouldn't you know, the very first game he played with the Pittsburgh Steelers, they lost. And he's like, oh, I don't want to go into that locker room. I hate going into the locker room after you lose. <laughs> because in my old team, when he walked through the doors after you lose, you don't say a word. 
Because the coaches, they're going to just level criticism at everybody. And the other players, they're just going to be trying to blame everybody else. And if the owner shows up, he's going to suck the joy right out of the room. You don't want to be there. But that first day after a loss, he came into the Steeler locker room, locker room and the players were laughing and joking. He's looking around and he's like, we're going to get in trouble. We can't be laughing and joking after a loss. They've just lost a game and they're laughing and joking. They, they, they seem to have lost the game but held on to the joy. And he said, you know, we sat down, we looked at the relevant tape, and we went to work to face the next week. It was a whole different environment, he said. It was an environment of grace instead of criticism. And, you know, criticism has its place. When it is embedded into an organization, or when it is deeply rooted in a family, or when it is part of your being, when criticism is part of who you are, then joy is absent, and evidently so is winning. Grace brings joy. What was that that Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery? <laughs> Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. The passage doesn't say this, but what Jesus did, you know, he had knelt down in the ground and he wrote some things. We don't know what he wrote. After everyone left, when he was saying, Neither do I condemn you, he had a big bucket of joy and he's pouring it out on top of her. Not literally but spiritually and emotionally, you can bet that woman felt completely different after that gracious interaction with Jesus. Being critical, that's joy sucking. Being gracious, that's pouring out joy. And as I read Proverbs 4.23, I see it's really a matter of my heart that makes a difference. Gentleness and insistence are part of this contrast we're talking about between joy pouring and joy sucking. Insistent people are demanding people. They're pushy people. They're adamant about things. They're unrelenting about things, and they're inflexible, and they're joyless. Someone has said that gentleness is joy outwardly expressed. Demanding people don't pour that out, but gentle people pour out joy generously. Philippians 4, chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is writing, and he says a verse that you may be familiar with. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And, and you know, I was thinking about that, and I never really understood why, why those two sentences are back to back that way. I mean, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. What does that have to do with my gentleness? Oh, I know. Maybe it's this. Let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near and he's watching. I don't think so. I don't think that would evoke gentleness in me, maybe a little paranoia, but not gentleness. I have a feeling that what Jesus is saying is that when you are gentle and when you are not demanding, you are joyful and you can be joyful because God is with you. And God will fight your battles when you're gentle. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. When I was young, that used to disappoint me because I really wanted to get even. I wanted to be Josie Wales, right? But now, as I've matured in my faith, in my walk with Christ, I am so glad it's his. He's with me. He'll take care of, of fighting those battles. And I can be gentleness toward everyone because he's near. And being gentle is much more powerful than being demanding, much more powerful than being insistent. You have seen parents that are gentle. I gotta tell you, I just watched my son with his little girl. She's two and a half. He is the most gentle dad that I think I've had the privilege of watching. And I'm saying that just because he's my son. <laughs> I thought to myself as I'm watching him with the gentleness thing, I'm like, he is so gentle with her. Where did he learn that? And obviously, he learned it from my wife because, you know, I flunked the test at the beginning. Right? When you watch parents who are gentle, you're watching a beautiful thing happening. And when you watch parents who are demanding, that's a little embarrassing sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> it's not pretty. It's joy-sucking to everyone, to them, to the kid, and to the people watching. Because... 
Having that insistent, non-gentle mentality is never effective in the long run. But when you're gentle, you're pouring out joy. And as I read Proverbs 4, 23, I think it's really a matter of the heart. A matter of the heart. Joy pouring and joy sucking, they're really a, a matter of encouragement and demoralization. I'm really demoralized or I'm really encouraged. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, the scripture says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I first saw this in Mrs. Lefevre. Some of you may have heard me speak of her before. I probably would have failed fifth grade if it weren't for Mrs. Lefevre. Halfway through the year, the teacher that I had had to go on a leave of absence. She became sick and couldn't teach any longer. She and I never connected. That is an understatement and a half. I can remember her way to motivate you is to tell you you were lazy and you were stupid. That was a non-starter with me. And I performed very poorly as her student. It was joyless. The class was demoralizing. But and I say this jokingly, the Lord God did bring an ailment upon her. <laughs> I don't think so. But she did have to take a leave of absence. I think she had surgery or something. And she was replaced by Mrs. Lefevre. And Mrs. Lefevre, she poured out joy. And that whole classroom changed. That whole classroom came to life. And everyone noticed she called little fifth grade, redheaded, skinny, uh, ADD Steve Shields up to her desk. We didn't even know what ADD was then. We thought it was ABC alphabet. <laughs> she says something like this, Steve, I see that your, your standardized testing says you should be a good student. And when I look back, you know, like several years, I see that you have been a good student, but presently your grades aren't showing it. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, you're going to get A's. You're going to do well. I'm going to see to it that you do because I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you become a really good student. And I thrived under her teaching. It changed everything for me. And the difference was that she was an encourager and she was not demoralizing. That first teacher demoralized everyone in that classroom except a couple favorites she had. Mrs. Lefevre encouraged everybody in that classroom, even the favorites. She poured out joy through encouragement. And when I read Proverbs chapter 423, I think it's really a matter of the heart. In case you've forgotten, which I know you haven't, I do want to say Jesus' heart overflows with joy. A quick overview of the New Testament shows that even at his advent, even at his birth, there, the incarnate Son of God is pouring out joy. Luke 2.10, the angels are, show up to these shepherds who are taking care of their flocks at night, and, and they say, don't be afraid, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Good news of great joy at his advent. And we walk away from that singing, joy to the world, the Lord has come. Joy. Jesus' heart overflows with it. He poured out that joy at his advent. He poured out that joy through his ministry. One of my favorite examples of this is when he sends out, he's been working with these disciples, not just the 12, but a larger group of disciples, and he takes 72 of them and he says, I want you to go do the kind of ministry that you've just been watching me do. And he empowers them to do that, and they go out to do that, and they come back in Luke 17, they come, or Luke 10 rather, they come back and they say, think how excited they are, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus reply in 1018, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, let me tell you how he's not saying that. Lord, even the demons are subject to, to us in your name. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It's not it. It's... Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like Satan. It's like Satan. I can't even say it. I'm so excited. 
It's like Satan falling like lightning from heaven. And he's just overflowing with joy because he's watching what's happening and he loves to see it. And joy is his nature. Even at the end of the age, even at the end of the age, there's joy in Christ. Do you know why heaven is heaven? It's not the streets of gold. It's not the avoidance of hell. It's not that you don't have to do any work. Heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. The one who loved you and gave himself for you. And in Revelation 22, verse 3, it says, no longer will there be any curse. No longer will there be any curse. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve them. They will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads. No more curse because the Lamb is there. No more curse, only joy. Jesus' heart overflows with joy and he dissolves anything counter to it. I want to be like Jesus. But frankly, I failed the quiz. <laughs> I failed the quiz. I'm a joy sucker. Chat GPT says so. And it's the artificial intelligence. It's got to be right, right? I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's right. Maybe. But I do know this. It'd be good for me and probably good for you to give some consideration on how do we get joy that we can pour out? Where do we get it? How do we find it? Where can I take my bucket to fill it up with joy so that I can pour it out on others? And I think I know doggone well it begins with the cross of Christ. Everything good does. It begins with God. I think you can begin to fill your joy bucket by receiving, experiencing, and applying God's grace. Because I don't think anything can suck the joy from your life more effectively than sin and shame and guilt. And I don't think anything can inject joy into your life more effectively than the cross of Christ taking away your sin, your guilt, and your shame when you've done something wrong, and you know it's wrong, it's hard to feel joy. And people try a lot of ways to get rid of that, you know, to get rid of that guilt and shame that, that you feel. This is one of our favorites, right? Hey, you're only human. <laughs> you mentioned this yesterday, right? Was that yesterday? Yeah, we, do, we all do that, right? Hey, I'm only human. That's not really reassuring. All that says is you're like eight billion other people that can't get their act together. You're not helping me with your only human. That means I'm like eight, eight billion other people who are morally bankrupt as well. Huh. Sometimes you might have the thought, well, maybe I can make up for it. You know, I, I, I didn't measure up to what I should be in the past, but I'm going to be better. Maybe I can make up for it. And sometimes that's true, but sometimes if we're honest, we know that the things that we're dealing with in our past are things that we'll never be able to fix. And we'll never be able to make up for those things. Sometimes someone might say, well, it wasn't really that bad. You're feeling this guilt, you're feeling this shame, it really wasn't that bad. Who says so? Listen to this sentence. Denying the wrongness of wrongdoing does not make it right doing. Hmm. Yeah. Let me just tell you my favorite inadequate way to deal with my own guilt and shame. It is to focus on someone else's guilt and shame. Right? <laughs> There's nothing I can do about my guilt and shame, so I'm going to criticize that other person. Did you see her? Do you know what he, did you ever hear that? I can remember when. Focus on someone else, get the focus off of me. And that, my friends, makes us into grade A joy suckers when we do that. None of those work. Christ is the only way to dispose of your guilt and shame. And when you recognize that his death on the cross was there as a payment for you and your guilt and shame, and when you, in your heart, 
turn to him, trusting him to forgive you. We say you are saved. That's what it means to be saved. What, what it means is you receive his grace and you receive his mercy and his forgiveness that you really don't deserve, but he gives it freely and that fills me with joy. You mean I can be forgiven by the God of heaven and earth? Wow, I will take that. And when you experience God's grace, you find grace to pour out in the form of joy to others. And even those who, yeah, I was saved a long time ago, like 40 years ago or whatever, you can still come and fill your bucket with the joy of God's grace. That, that is one of the reasons we come to church and gather here to be reminded of God's grace. That is why we interact together at church fellowships. It's why we do everything together. We do ministry together. It's the value of Kerwin's Alliance. We don't go off just doing whatever we want to do ministry-wise. We work together to do it because we find joy in the grace that we experience as we interact. It's why we sing songs like Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, It Saved a Wretch Like Me. It's because we want to be reminded of that grace because when we receive, experience, and apply God's grace, then we find grace to pour out as joy upon others. You fill your joy bucket by experiencing God's grace. And if you've never done that, if you've never come to Christ and say, I need to be forgiven, the guilt and shame, I'd love you to take that. Would you take it? He says, I thought you'd never ask. And he takes it and he transforms your life and you find his grace and you experience joy. You find it by experiencing God's grace and applying it to your life. You, you fill up your joy bucket by laying hold of the gentleness of Jesus. He never force-fed people, this Jesus. He, he never bullied them to change. He invited people to change. And he said his yoke is easy. His burden is light. And when you come to him, you come as little children. Think of Jesus' words in Matthew 18. He says, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So you don't have to come to him as somebody. Hey, Jesus, look at all the stuff I've done for you. He's not interested in hearing that. You come to him like a little child, willing to ask for help, looking to embrace the wonder of grace and gentleness it is in him, open-hearted toward his joy. And you can do that. You can come to him like a little child because he is trustworthy. You can trust him. He is gentle. And when you embrace the gentleness of Jesus, it changes who you are. One of our small groups on Thursdays is reading Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. I read that and taught it in a small group a year or two ago. I got a different perspective on the gentleness of Jesus that changed who I am. I can't imagine how bad I would have flunked the test <laughs> before I read that book. His gentleness gives you joy to pour out on others. You can begin to fill your bucket and continue doing so by simply encouraging others. Look for the good in others and tell them you see it. Did you hear that sentence? Look for the good in others and tell them you see it. You know, when I tell you that, when I say, look for the good in others, it's kind of like telling a little kid, say thank you. I never remember to say thank you. And I hate it. Well, I shouldn't say never. I often forget to say thank you. That's more accurate. And I hate it when I do that. Like the person's already out, out of the room. And I'm like, I forgot to tell her thank you. Because saying thank you doesn't come automatically. You have to remind yourself and discipline yourself to do that. And that helps you be a grateful person and have a grateful heart. You have to remind yourself and discipline yourself to look for the good in others, just like you have to remind yourself and discipline yourself to say thank you. It doesn't come naturally. And so you have to choose to do that. And the best time to look to do that is when you're seeing the bad in others. You know, they forgot that appointment they were supposed to have with me, or whatever it is. That's a great time to say, God, remind me of the good in them. Help me find the good in it. Help me see the good in them. And I, I just have to tell you, if you will look, you will see the good in that other person. It may be hard to see, 
but there's a good chance that it's there. And when you see God's goodness in others, you are encouraged and you're able to encourage them with sincerity. You can pour out joy, encourage them. So I had another discussion with chat GPT. I asked it to make me another quiz. I told it that I would like a quiz about whether or not I'm a joy spreader. Do I pour out joy? Let's take the quiz. Number one, do you react with genuine enthusiasm when a friend shares good news with you? I think I do. Number two, do you try to approach difficult situations or conflicts with empathy and willing to find, willingness to find a solution? Uh, yeah, I think so. Number three, have you given someone a com compliment or expressed your appreciation for them within the past week? I think I need 10 yeses on that one. Number four, do you try to learn from your setbacks and challenges or challenges and move on? I like that the word try is there, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. Number five, do you actively seek out ways to bring happiness to those around you? <laughs> yeah. Man, the chat GPT is really messed up because 20 minutes ago it told me that I was a joy sucker, and here it tells me I'm a joy spreader. What is going on? Right? The test means nothing. We're focusing your attention. We're thinking about the subject. I want to pray that you and I would be people who pour out joy that is genuine, genuine because it comes from the awareness of the grace we have received from Christ. I want to pray that you and I would be people who pour out joy that comes from having experienced the gentleness of Jesus and his non-demanding interaction with us. And I want to pray that you and I will be people who pour out joy because we've taken the time to look and see the beauty around us and the good in others and that joy would flow from us. That's a pretty good thing to pray for. If you want to join me in praying for that, let's stand together. Let's bow our hearts. Above all else, you tell us, God, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Indeed, Father, we recognize that apart from the work of the Spirit in our lives, apart from the redemption purchased for us in Christ and the sanctification that comes through him, our hearts are de desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. But when we encounter your grace and your mercy and when we find your gentleness and we see your goodness, our hearts are transformed. They are changed. We want joy to flow from our hearts. Forgive us when we have been less than a joy pourer, a joy pourer outer. Make us into individuals who overflow with grace and gentleness and love. May your Holy Spirit do this work within us because of the cross of Christ. <coughs> Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children. I just want to remind you that the uh, Genesis small group will be meeting tonight. I think we meet at 6.30. Is that correct? I'll let you know. Uh, so you're welcome to join us for that. I also want to ask uh, Brian if he would conclude our time in prayer. Brian? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We could remember this morning the message that, message that Pastor Steve gave us. Um, we all know that we're never going to get it right every time, but Lord, just uh, give us the grace that we need to be joy spreaders and not joy suckers. Mm -hmm. Lord, just ask that you uh, be with us as we leave and uh, let us be light to our community and ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Group, the Genesis small group will meet at 6.30 in the sanctuary tonight. God bless you.